Good morning, everybody, and thanks for coming. Yes, my name is Jeffrey Hamelman, and um, I never use the word retire, by the way, because that's sort of a disease, I think. So I just left my baking job after 41 years, but that's OK. So we're going to talk about bees for a couple of hours. And there might be a problem, and that is that I really don't know how to shut up when I'm talking about bees. So we <laughs> could be here another 24 hours after that. So, But um, a couple of things before we get started. There's a handout back there of just some interesting fun facts about bees. If you didn't get a copy, you might want to grab it. I brought several books with me. Um, I probably won't stay too much longer after this is over, so, so feel free while I'm talking if you want to browse through some books or anything like that. And the best format, I think, to do our program this morning would be to just keep the floor open. So if you have questions as we go along, no need to wait until the end. We'll just raise your hand and we'll talk about them um, as they come up. So I live in Heartland, down by White River. And I've been keeping bees since 1982. Um, maybe it would be equally accurate to say the bees have been keeping me since 1982. Um, there seem to be two types of people in the world. I know I'm painting a pretty broad brush stroke here, but it seems like there are people who, when they look inside of a beehive, they are filled with this profound dread, and they just want to get away as quickly as possible. There are other people who look inside a beehive, and they're filled with this often life-changing, profound fascination. Um, bees really are an extraordinary species of animals. Um, we'll be talking about starting with bees and the kind of equipment you need, locations, pests and diseases, all that manner of thing, plus whatever, whatever questions come up. But we might also meander into some of the more fascinating things about bees um, as we keep talking. So off we go. How many people have bees? Great. How does many it years? Count if you're trying and failing. <laughs> yes, it does. How many years have you been trying? Three years. Three years. Failed all three years. Okay. It breaks my heart. It, yeah. Uh, I, I feel like I'm a murderer because I'm not doing well enough. I know the feeling well. Yeah. It yeah. just brings me tears to, to speak about it. Yeah. I'm sorry. Maybe I'll have a couple of tips that might help your success rate a little bit. Thanks. Okay. And how long have you been keeping bees? Uh, Thirty years. Thirty. Yeah. How many colonies do you keep? I've had from zero to 40. Yeah, yeah. Huh. I've won now. You have one now. Mm. And do you have bees, sir? I've been on for 10 years. Yeah, yeah. I stopped for like three years. Mm hmm. My cousin last year. Yep. But I think they're dying. Yeah. It's more of a challenge than ever to keep bees, as probably everybody knows. Um, I've never been a commercial beekeeper. Um, my love of it is such that uh, the most I've ever had is 12 colonies because if it gets more than that, it feels like work and it's not, I'm not interested in it as a work sideline income kind of thing. I'm interested in it. Even if there weren't honey at the end of a good season, I would probably still keep bees simply for the fascination of keeping bees. So <clears throat> how many people hope to keep bees? That's beautiful to see. OK. Yeah, well, it's a real different world now. When I started in 1982, um, I never knew what my motive was. It was as if just one morning I woke up and there was this realization that, oh, I have to keep bees. I hadn't read books. Certainly, there was no YouTube or videos or anything. I was living on Chappaquiddick on Martha's Vineyard at the time, and so there were no fellow beekeepers I could become a protege towards. Um, so I don't know what really prompted me, but as soon as I did, I had kind of fallen down that rabbit hole of fascination, and I guess I never looked back. 
Um, over the years, again, I've never had more than 12. That's plenty for me. Right now, I like to keep it at about eight. I like to keep them all at my house. You know, you'll find if you start keeping bees that you're going to get a lot of people that say, oh, why don't you keep a colony at my house over here because it's great for them. And why don't you keep a colony over here? And then before you know it, you know, you're logging 10,000 miles a summer just visiting bees on other people's property. So I like to keep mine personally nice and close so that I can sit out there. I've got a chair that I sit in. I'll put it really accurately where it's located. So if that's m the first colony, I get a chair. I sit right here. And now and again, my wife has to come out and wake me up because I f <laughs> I'm not joking. I fall sound asleep. What are you thinking about eating today? <laughs> <laughs> So um, I came to Vermont full time in 1983, and I think I joined the Vermont Beekeepers Association in 84 or 85. Um, one thing I would encourage anyone who's really interested in bees is to join VBA. It's a wonderful, wonderful organization that's very dedicated to education. Uh, it's a whopping $15 a year to be a member. Uh, we have a winter meeting that always takes place in conjunction with the Vermont Farm Show, which forever and a day was in Barrie. And then, I don't know, five or six years ago, it got too big for Barrie. So now it's up in Essex. That winter meeting is only open to members of EBA. And that'll be taking place a week from Tuesday, if you're interested. Um, and it's always at the Farm Show on the Tuesday. And then in the summer, we have a meeting that ranges all over the state. Uh, this summer, it'll be in Swanton. Last summer, it was, where was it last summer? I can't remember. We had it in Heartland a few years ago, where I live. Um, and I was secretary of EBA for about five years. The, the bylaws say that officers are able to serve for three years. So I kind of said after five years, I don't want to go to jail. So I'm going to stop being the secretary. Um, but I've been already warned that Next Tuesday at the winter meeting, um, I've been kind of conscripted to become the treasurer. We'll see how that goes. So anyway, a great organization if you really seriously want to be involved in bees because you can learn so much from the real masters. Again, I'm an amateur who's very, very passionate about bees. Um, there are some real masters in Vermont um, whose knowledge is really extensive, and it's available. So you want to keep bees, what do you need? Well, you don't need a ton of land. Um, there are bees being kept on top of the Louvre in Paris. There are bees being kept um, on rooftops in a lot of cities in the <coughs> US. London has bees. Brooklyn probably has you know, one colony of bees per hipster. And there's a lot of hipsters in Brooklyn, so there's a lot of bees in Brooklyn. So you can keep bees <clears throat> in most locales. In Vermont, we're very, very lucky because our climate tends to be favorable for beekeeping. Of course, we all know you're all gardeners. I'm a gardener, too. And we all know that um, the climate really is getting crazy. So there are plenty of years where these days, it only rains once in July. It starts on the 1st, and it ends on the 31st, that kind of rain. So we're seeing a lot of really wacko stuff, of course. But um, Vermont is very, very favorable in that when the first pollen and nectar is available, which where I live is usually the end of March or very beginning <coughs> of April with the poplars, followed by the soft maples, and then there's willows and things like that. But Usually by the 1st of April or so, if the weather's favorable, the bees can get out and collect nectar and pollen. And in a good year, something is blooming right through the asters in October. Um, and this is really great, because the bees have a steady source of a very, very varied diet. Uh, there are many parts of the country, if you lived in, say, Virginia or the southeast or many parts of California, you'll get these early nectar flows. They might be over by the beginning of May. And then there is nothing until the autumn. So typically, beekeepers then have to be feeding their bees in summer, which seems really bizarre for somebody who's used to keeping bees in Vermont. 
Um, so we are, we are in a favorable state. If you're in a very wooded area, you probably won't get too much honey. I lived for many years down outside Brattleboro. I owned a bakery for a long time in Brattleboro, and my bees were near a lot of woods. And really, the most I could really get was maybe 40 pounds of honey, surplus honey from a colony, and that would have been that would have felt like a pretty good year. Where I am now in Heartland, it's much more <coughs> mixed. There's more open land as well as a lot of forest, and there's this is still mind-boggling. To me, there was one three or four years ago, one of my colonies yielded over 200 pounds of honey. And that's the stuff that I take. That's not the stuff that they also keep for themselves to get through the year. That was extra honey. So that's pretty startling. I consider, again, since I'm not an expert commercial beekeeper, if I get 75 pounds from a colony, I feel like this is pretty great. Um, and I'm happy with anything because my goal is to have healthy bees. And so actually twice in the last 36 years of beekeeping, um, I did not take any honey. And that was because I felt like, you know, it's been a rough summer for the bees and I, I'm gonna leave everything for them so that they can be strong. Um, all right, so <clears throat> if you have the choice, you'll want a location that is reasonably sunny. This will help the bees get started in the mornings. Um, if you can do it, you'll want your bees to be at the top of a rise as opposed to at the bottom. Moist air pools downhill, and if your bees are kept in an area that's constantly moist, it's, it's not good for them. They're not happy there, for one thing, so if you're near a brook or something, that might not be a very favorable place to put the bees. So if you can have a little elevation, let the colder air and the moister air drain down, that will be great. Um, again, if you have the choice, face the colony to the <coughs> south, the, or, or southeast, something like that. Um, that'll enable the early light to come in, warm up the hive, get the bees going. So, and if you don't have that, any of those options, or if you only have some of those options, you can still keep bees, right? Um, what do you need? Well, then you need equipment. <clears throat> Clearly, this isn't new equipment, um, but this is, I'll show you right from the bottom on up. This is a bottom board, which you'll need. A lot of beekeepers these days use what's called a screened bottom board. So this would actually be quarter inch hardware cloth covering most of this surface here. Quarter inch hardware cloth meaning um, it'll keep a lot of critters from coming up through it. And the principle behind the screen bottom board is that varroa mites, which are really the worst plague of bees uh, for the last 25, 30 years, Varroa mites that are groomed by the bees and fall off will fall through the screen and won't be able to get back up, so they'll die. It's not any longer considered to be a particularly effective way to treat for varroa because not that many fall through and die. So there's other strategies that you have to employ, and I want to use that term carefully, but if you want to be one of these, so oh, I'm just gonna, you know, let the bees do their thing and I'm not gonna treat them or take care of them in any way, they will die. They absolutely will die. Unless you are one of probably 10 cutting edge experts in the world who really successfully have been able to um, evolve their local bees so that they are completely resistant to these mites, then your bees are gonna die. End of story right there. We'll talk more about that later. So you start with the bottom board. On top of that, typically goes a deep hive body. This is a deep hive body. When you first get bees, you'll need one of these. But if you're going to get bees, you'll want to get enough equipment at the outset so that you can have, in a good year, you might make some honey the first year. Uh, so you'll want to have enough equipment so that you're not saying, okay, I needed to put on another one of these deep bodies a week ago and it hasn't come in the mail yet. Then you're behind and 
you always want to be one step ahead of the bees. So you're going to start with one hive body, typically two deep hive bodies is considered the year-round house for the bees, right? Um, this will hold 10 frames, and we'll get into frames in a moment. So if I got some bees, and I started them out in one, and they're probably filling three, four, or five frames, I'll give them 10 frames, and when they get up to about seven or eight that they're occupying, I'll put on the second story. This is their year-round <coughs> brood chamber. So we'll call that either, we'll call those two stories the brood chamber, okay? That's their year-round house. You don't take honey from there. You will be checking on your bees in the brood chambers, but this is their year-round quarters. Um, on top of that goes an inner cover, which is here. It's got a as you see, a vent hole there also. Most of them, when you buy them, they have a little notch here. This is for ventilation. In the winter, it's actually an upper entrance. Some inner covers don't come with this, so you would just saw it out so that you have that for the bees, okay? So these are pretty much components that every beehive is gonna have. Bottom board, start with one deep hive body, brood chamber, put on a second. And then this is going to be filled with frames. <clears throat> there are many, many, many ways to utilize frames. In the old days, when I started out, you would have top bar, side bars, bottom bar, and you would buy pure beeswax foundation. This thin sheet here is called a sheet of foundation. It's embossed with a hexagon, which is the shape that the bees utilize to draw out and use to store their brood or their honey or their pollen or whatever. Uh, but this is called foundation. Um, in the old days, the foundation you'd buy, there was only one style, and it would have these vertical wires, five or six wires, and then what you would have to do is put in cross wires back and forth three or four times, get them nice and tight. Then you'd have to heat this little knurled roller and you'd roll it over the wires and that would melt the wax so that the wires would be embedded in the wax. It was very time consuming. I never bothered much because I like doing it. It was a nice winter activity to get my frames ready. Um, but nowadays, there's so many different options on what kind of frames you can buy. You can still buy what I just described. It's called crimp wired foundation. Um, I don't use that anymore. Not so much for the time. I really don't want to be too much involved in getting beeswax from the commercial industry because the wax is not particularly clean anymore. There's a lot of stuff that's showing up in wax, chemical residues and things like that that I don't really want to see in my hive. So I stopped using the crimped wired foundation. So this is called DuraGilt. This is a sheet of plastic that has wax on both sides of it. And there's, you might be able to see this on each end. You can see, I don't know if it looks shiny or not, but there's a metal strip here, that, that vertical strip. That gives the frame some strength. And then instead of all that tedious cross wiring, you put in these things that are protruding here just above my finger. Those are called support pins. They're basically stout bobby pins, basically. And you put them in from the side. And so a couple of those on each side plus that vertical metal bar, and you've got enough strength, right? So what are the bees gonna do when they have this? Well, the next thing they're gonna do is draw out the foundation. This is called drawn comb. You can see down here the residue of plastic that wasn't drawn out, but all the rest of this has been drawn out, so the bees um, I'll pass this around, it's a beautiful sight. 
the bees, um, <clears throat> they use a hexagon. It's, the, it's got two characteristics. It's the strongest shape that's possible that enables the greatest amount of storage space. So clearly, a circle would be silly because you've got all that space between circles. Too much wasted space. A square doesn't have enough strength. So a hexagon is meant to be the strongest shape in nature. The bees draw the comb out into a hexagon. Um, they'll use each of those cells to store water, pollen, nectar, nectar that's been ripened into honey. The queen will lay eggs in there. The eggs will hatch into larva. The larva will then pupate and will be covered with a coating of wax and just sort of hive residue. It's not pure wax that covers the brood. And then those will hatch and become young bees. Right, so this is a multi-purpose shape. Um, that one you'll see if you notice that on the surface of it, on the top bar, it says 14. I tend to put the date on frames of what year I put it into the hive, just so I have a sense of how old the frames are. Um, there's another drawn comb. This one maybe even is more interesting because two characteristics here. What do you see on this one that's different from that one? The black color. It's much darker. What does that signify? I wonder, because I've got some that are that way and some yep. that are that way. Yep. Um, what it signifies is that it's much older, right? The bees have walked over this a lot more. A lot more brood has been laid in there, and, that, and so it darkens with it's age. Antique in their world. Well, actually, <laughs> yes. And if you see here, this is evidence of cross wires, right? So this started out as that frame that I mentioned that you have to go back and forth and back and forth. What else do you see that's different? You might not see it because this hasn't really gone around yet. Yeah, look at that, huh? What's that all about? Is that the mites? Nope, nope, but you see the size difference on the bottom rows? Can you see that? Oh, the larger cells. Yeah. All right, larger cells signify drones, right? So you have one queen in a hive. You've got upwards of 50,000 workers in the middle of the summer that are um, females. Um, and then you've got drones. The drones are the largest. And so when you see these large cells, you'll know that's where the drones were laid by the queen, OK? Um, and curiously, that frame doesn't have any drone cells at all, which is very, very rare, right? So she climbs down to the bottom of this frame to lay these? What the queen does is she dips her abdomen into the cell. She'll walk around and she'll kind of inspect each cell with her antennae. And then she'll choose a cell and dip her abdomen into it and then lay the appropriate egg. So it's pretty fascinating. Um, I'm probably jumping ahead a little bit, but we might as well since we're talking about this. Um, so a queen is born in a hive, and we can get into more details about how she's born, uh, how she's chosen, how she's raised, and all that. But once the queen is born, she's in this black box, and she has to go on a mating flight. She's not fertilized yet. She needs to mate to get fertilized. So after, it usually takes, I don't know, maybe a week she's in the hive after hatching. Um, yes, yeah, sure. You can pass that too. Maybe somebody else wants to see it. Then she goes on a mating flight. Well, where does she go? Well, there's these things called drone congregating areas. Think of a singles bar in college. <laughs> <laughs> right? The drones that go to those drone congregating areas were not alive last year. They might not have been alive last month. But the drone congregating areas are the same year after year. So somehow, the drones and the queen know where these places are. There are I think they're supposed to be about 20 feet in the air. And when the queen goes on mating flights, 
She goes to a drone congregating area. There's all these drones there. They mate with her, so she's taking on the sperm from a dozen or more drones. The drones are in pure ecstasy until they realize, oh shit, now I'm dying because they, <laughs> they don't live after mating with the queen. Their genitals are ripped out, so. But they they got a smile on their face. <laughs> Way to go. Right? And <clears throat> then the queen has a lifetime of sperm. And it's from various drones, which means what? Biodiversity. So I have a question. The drones that come to those mating areas, yeah. they're not from the hive that... They're, they're from the region. From the region. Yeah. And how yeah. far is that region down? That's a good question, uh, and I don't know the answer. Yeah. Would it be like 20 miles? Long? No, it wouldn't be that much, but it's probably a few miles. So if there are wild hives and trees, which used to be quite common until the mites came along and pretty much wiped out everything. Um, but the, the drones from the wild hives, the feral hives would come, managed <coughs> hives, the drones go, <coughs> and they mate with the queen if they're lucky. So now the queen has a lifetime of sperm from multiple sources, so she's got a great deal of biodiversity. Question? And when you buy a queen, she's already fertilized, I assume? Generally speaking, you're buying mated queens, yeah. Yeah, it's al almost never do you buy an unmated queen, yeah. Question? If this didn't have this little template of hexagons, would they build this hexagon? They would, and I've got some frames that I can show you, too. Um, and now, when the queen is laying her eggs, she dips her abdomen into the cell, and as the egg is coming down through her body, she chooses either to open her spermatheca, which is this valve, I guess, that allows the, f the egg to be fertilized or not. So if she fertilizes the egg, it'll be a worker. If she doesn't fertilize the egg, it'll be a drone. So the queen makes those decisions. Does she usually lay the drones like in the same area, at, like on that frame? It varies some. Often they'll be further towards the perimeter. Uh, there is a real method to the way they organize the whole, as you would expect, with something that's been doing this for a lot of years. Um, so we'll come back to those things, because I want to keep talking about frames. So everybody has now had a chance to see just the foundation, and then the drawn comb. You can also buy 100% plastic foundation, which personally I don't like. Um, a lot of bee communication takes place via the comb, and I don't like the aesthetics of this personally, and I don't know if the bees like it or not, but these, this is becoming much, much, much more common. So this looks like a sheet of foundation, but everything is plastic. What you would do if you bought this stuff is you'd get some wax. I keep my own, my own wax, and I use it in certain baking, and I also um, use it to brush on if I have any frames that are plastic. Um, I'll brush it on, and that makes it more attractive to the bees. A very common thing now is to buy the wooden components, the top bar, bottom bar, and sidebars, so you're having a wooden frame and plastic foundation. So that's common, too. So you can see there's all kinds of permutations on a the theme, ma'am. So I noticed on your um, deep foundation that there were two holes yeah. on the bottom. Yeah. Yeah. I think those are meant to just be ease of passage for the bees. I'm pretty sure that's why they put them there. And another way you can buy your frames is plastic and drawn plastic comb. That's also very common. That way the bees don't have to draw it out, which takes a lot of energy, resources, and time. Um, it's already done. So a lot of commercial beekeepers like that. I also don't like plastic because when it gets hot, it sort of bends, whereas wood stays rigid. So, and I don't like the aesthetics personally of plastic. So, all right. So 
I played around and built a wooden frame, put some vertical wires here. Can you see these? And then I just took some foundation and I glued it along here. I did this with about 20 frames a couple years ago. And then I just put that into a hive. And they'll do the rest. And they'll do the rest, right? And eventually they would fill this whole thing. But in nature, this would be the natural shape that you would see for the hives, right? There's something that appeals to you on that too because it's their shape. It's their shape. Now, please put your nose on that and smell it and then pass that around because one of the most intoxicating aromas in the world is beeswax, fresh beeswax. It's, it's really, that's enough to say I want to be a beekeeper, just smelling wax, right? It's amazing. Yeah, I know this. Oh. So if you've heard of top bar hives, anybody heard of top bar hives? Okay, these are, they were developed actually for Kenya. They're called, tip, the formal name would be Kenyan top bar hives because they're very cheap to build um, and it was a way to try to get some livelihood to people in Kenya. Now they're becoming more common. You'll see them often in the States. If you look at bee catalogs, you'll probably see top bar hive type stuff. Top bar hive basically looks like a coffin <coughs> with often slightly sloped sides. And all you do is you put a piece of wood across and then a little strip of foundation or even just melt some wax and put it across the top of that bar and put that in the hive and then the bees will make that shape. There's no wires, there's no wooden frames other than that top strip of wood. Um, some people like it because it's the most natural um, I don't use top bar hives because getting the honey out of it means you're going to destroy the, f the wax, the frame. Uh, and secondly, because the principle of the top bar hive is the hive itself might be this wide and it might have a divider board in there. So when I start out, I might put in five of those wooden th strips and as the bees draw that out, I'll move the divider board, put in a few more. As they build that out, few more. So basically the hive is going horizontally. In our climate that's not favorable um, because by having it spread out there's not enough warmth for the bees. The bees spray, they all rise, right. and there's no so vertical that's why we have, exactly. So it's much favorable, thank you. It's much better to have a vertical hive in our climate. There, by the way, I should have said this at the outset. If you go to a meeting of beekeepers and there's 10 beekeepers sitting around and you ask them a question, expect a minimum of 20 answers. Yeah. <laughs> so everything I'm saying, there could be other beekeepers, there will be other beekeepers who have a completely different opinion. So it comes down to your style and just how you want to approach beekeeping, basically. Okay, so <clears throat> did I show everything? Oh, no. So. We, okay, so we've put bees in here. We filled it up enough so that we're going to put a second deep hive body on there. They're filling that up enough. Now we might say, okay, they're getting strong. Now I'm going to put on medium or shallow hive bodies. Those we'll call supers, honey supers, right? So the bees are living in these two boxes. And now I can put another box that's maybe this high or this high. That's a medium frame. That's a shallow frame. This, the honey supers, are where the surplus honey goes. So the bees are going to keep on just filling it up all year long. They're going to just go to the last minute. It's like in our garden, you know. I'll say to my wife, okay, what do we have? 75 jars of tomatoes canned this year? Okay, but there's still some out there. Let's keep going, right? We don't know what next year is going to be like. You all know that feeling, right? It's the same thing with the bees. They're going to store as much honey as they possibly can. The stuff above their brood chamber, the year-round house, 
that's the stuff that you're going to take. Right? That's where you're putting your supers. That's they're where the supers go. They're, they're, they're going to go above the brood chamber. And if they fill it out, you can take it and harvest it. And if you're at all like me, people are going to tell you, oh my god, I can't believe how delicious your honey is. And you're going to feel this immense pride until you realize that all you did was steal it. <laughs> right? Oh, my honey is so good, isn't it? Well, actually, I just stole it, but it is good. <laughs> so, um, so do you get the sense of the components of the hive now? All right. The inner cover is always going to go above the highest box you have. On top of that goes the outer cover. And that's it. Okay? So you basically have two of these on top of each other that get stay on top to build, basically, for your bees. Right. You'll go into them to examine your hive. Yes, that's right. So the position stays the same in, in the hive structure? Not. <laughs> Typically, I'm going to finish answering your question, and I'll come back to yours, because it's a slightly it's different the topic. Same, in the same vein. So you have those two on top of each other, and then the honey you take is from those shallower boxes. That's right. You wouldn't take it from here unless you're and really greedy. the second one? I'm sorry? No, not the second one. Remember, we're going to call these the brood chamber the boxes. Two. Okay. And the brood I just have a hard time picturing the two on top of each other in my head, but that's okay. I, I'm sure there's photos in some of those books that's over okay. there. OK? <laughs> um, typically, the first inspection in the spring, which is usually April or so, um, let's say you've got these two. They've been on all winter. Bees move up. That's their natural thing. So in the fall, as they know it's getting colder, the bees will force the queen down to the bottom rearrange their honey stores so they'll empty out cells and repack it in different cells so that they go into the winter with the bees in the lower part of the hive. And then up here, they'll have their stores. As the winter goes on, they gradually move up as they consume their stores. In the spring, almost always, your bees will be in the top box. So the first thing that happens when you do your winter, your spring cleaning is you reverse the hive bodies. It means the bees are up here. I'm going to put that one on the bottom and the other one on top. That way the bees still can move up, right? And this is after the pollen sources are already in place. Usually, place yep. Start, yep. About at that, that time. Around that season, yeah. yep. So that would be your spring inspection. Reversing is recommended. It's a good thing to do. But those two will always be on the bottom, even though you may be switching you know, bottom one this year with bottom one uh, with the top one next year. Yeah, they could be in either position. It's right. not really going to matter. They will, those two will always be on the bottom. And your yes, will always exactly. Be on the and tell me about the inner cover again. How does that work? The inner cover is going to be just above the highest box that you have. So when you start and you buy bees, you'll have one box, one inner cover, one outer cover. Okay, it goes directly below the outer cover. Right? Yeah. That's right. And then after the next box goes on, it'll be here. You might wind up in a good year with four medium or shallow supers of honey. The inner cover will always be up here or wherever the appropriate place is. Everything else comes off the top. It goes in the house, in the basement. Yep, or the belly. Yes. It goes in one of those places, <laughs> right? Right. Um, go ahead. I have one more question. You don't put that um, box on the ground, do you? Do you elevate it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And how high do you elevate it? Well, that's really up to you. You have to consider that the higher it is, if you've got three supers, you might need a step ladder. So you want it off the ground. Some people just make a, a crude two by four frame. Um, I usually put two cinder blocks and then a piece of wood that's larger than this. There's many, many ways to do it. Um, but 
it's favorable to have it off the ground. The ground is too moist, your equipment will rot pretty quickly, and it can be a big problem with skunks if it's right on the ground. We'll talk about that when we get to pests, right? Wouldn't you also suppose that if you went too high and, and you're potentially not in a very sheltered from the northwest wind thing, that you're risking the, the cold from having them much higher, you know, excessively high? Except that it's summer when these are on, so that wouldn't be too much of a concern, okay? Um, okay, so a couple more things. One, this is called 10 frame equipment. This will hold 10 frames each box. Oh, maybe 10 years ago, because the average age of beekeepers was going up, um, you started seeing eight frame equipment. So it's just a slightly smaller box, means a little easier to lift. Uh, one of these full of honey is between 90 and 100 pounds which is another good reason why you don't want to be spending the summer moving these around. It's really heavy. A medium super full of honey will yield about 40 to 45 pounds of honey. So that doesn't count the wax, the box, or the frame weight. But a medium with nine frames in it is going to have about 40 to 45 pounds of honey, and a shallow super is going to have about 30 pounds of honey. So there's substantial weight. So eight frame, a lot of people are gravitating towards eight frame equipment just because it isn't so heavy. And I know some wonderful people who have been absolutely dedicated to beekeeping for decades yeah, yeah. who good. stopped beekeeping. Has everybody seen this? Did everybody smell it? Okay. If you didn't like the aroma, um, your car is somewhere out there. <laughs> um, I know people that have gotten out of beekeeping just because it got too heavy, and they are committed to the bees, but they just can't do the work, which is sad. So eight frame can be favorable in that regard. Um, another thing to point out is that it's becoming more common in Vermont and other cold states to have the brood chamber comprised not just of two deeps, but two deeps and a medium, or two deeps and a shallow. You'll see that very, very commonly. The principle behind that is if the bees have that extra super, either a medium or a shallow, they have that much more stores to get through the winter, right? And beekeepers go back and forth on whether or not that's the best way to go or not. Question. Well, you would, there are visual clues without even pulling out frames because you can see the drawn comb just looking in there. Alternatively, you could do the following. This is like super jiffy and it's not really disruptive to the bees. You could go like that and you can see how much is drawn out. You can see some brood. And then that would be a very non-invasive way to say, yeah, time for another one. But ideally, what you're going to do is be looking into the bees, because you're going to want to see how the brood pattern is. Is the queen laying? Is she vigorous? Is it sloppy pattern? How do they look, right? Um, for that, you'll need some tools and equipment. It doesn't take too, too, too much. You're going to need a hive tool. That's about five or six bucks right there. Um, they come in many forms. This is a pretty standard one that has been around forever and a day. I always keep at least a couple because if you lose one, you don't want to be out a hive tool. So you're better off buying a couple. And I should probably paint both of these so that they have, um, so that they're, if I drop them in the grass, I can see them. I like to keep, if I'm in, checking on all my hives, I like to be able to write down what's going on, just so when I get inside, I can be writing. I keep a little page for each hive that I have, and I like to fill in how things are looking. Um, what else do you need? This is a frame spacer. So as we said, this will hold 10 frames. When it's all drawn out and full of bees, 
getting a frame out can be tough. It's easy to squish bees, right? There's not much space between the frames. So a lot of beekeepers, once they've drawn out all 10, they pull one out and they keep only nine in the box. That way, it's easier to pull frames out without crushing bees. I personally prefer nine frames. A lot of beekeepers say no, tens the way, you'll have more bees in each box. I don't like to kill bees. I know it's inevitable if you're gonna be a beekeeper. I feel like I kill fewer bees if I keep nine frames. So this is simply so that I can then go in here and space the frames correctly because, can everybody just see here? The bees have what's called bee space. It's roughly three-eighths of an inch. To the bees, that means enough space to build our frames, not excess, but not too small. If, if you had less than three-eighths, the bees might close the whole thing off. If you have more than three-eighths, three the bees are likely to build what's called burr comb. So they'll say, oh, look at all this extra space. We can get another frame in here. Well, they don't have the wooden frame, so they're just building it in between two frames, and it's going to really muck up your whole hive, because then if there's brood in there, you're going to have to decide if you're going to kill all that brood to get your spacing back to normal. So keeping your frame spaced properly is really important. So it's a lot easier for me to just use this put it in there, and then I know that's good. So that's kind of down the pike. So that's if you were to keep nine. Yes, yes. You always start with 10 because think of it like this. If I only had nine in there, there's a lot of space between that flat sheet and the next flat sheet. So the bees are going to definitely build burr comb between them, and it's going to screw everything up. So you start with 10. Once all 10, are like this, then you decide if you want to go with 9 or 10. If you space it well, they won't build burr comb in a 9 frame hive. When you're starting them out initially, I, or, or what I have, I've always noticed the center four to six frames are always built out more, sure. and the, the last two or four on the outside That's are right. built out less. That's right. Now, does it pay? I've kind of wondered about this too at some point. Take those that are built out a little more and swap places? You can do that with the following caveat, OK? Everybody understands what that question was? The center frames are going to get, OK. Let's look at, this is sort of like, looking at one frame is sort of like looking at an MRI. It's just this little slice of a hole, right? And it can be misleading. Let's look at it in terms of a three-dimensional brood nest. Right, so think of the shape of, I don't know, we'll say a football. It's not really a football. But if you put a football in this hive, these outer frames are not part of where the brood is being laid. The brood is where the football is, right? And out here, there's no football. So you can then, when you're starting out and the bees are starting to build stuff out, you can say, oh, well, The brood is in here, these four. This frame has nectar and pollen, which they keep near the brood because they got to feed the brood. This frame has nectar and pollen, but there's no brood in here. So I'm going to take this frame and put it out there so I can put this frame in here and have them draw that frame out. You can do that with the nectar and pollen. You don't do it with the brood. So if the brood is, again, if you had brood here, you would not say, I'm going to move this one out here so that I can put this one in here so they can draw that out. Don't mess the brood nest. Never mess up the brood nest. Okay? They organize it in a certain way for a certain reason. Okay? Yes? Well, the problem is when you've got six or seven drawn out, you're going to put the second box on, right? Mm -hmm. And 
they're then going to move up, and then they're going to tend to ignore the outer ones in the lower box. So you want to be you want to be careful about just leaving it. The other thing is, if you leave it until they worked all of it out, they might say, "Wow, we're pretty strong. Look at that. We don't have any more space. We filled this out. We don't have any more space. We're strong enough to swarm. Let's go and." take our great gene pool and send half the bees into the woods. So you want to, that's why you want to have all your equipment before you start with bees, so that you're not saying, oh boy, I wish I had another box because this is getting full and I don't have one yet. You need to have everything ready before the season starts. And when you put your second box on, you put one of the out so you only have nine in the bottom, is that what you do? Um, that would be a time you could do that. If they've drawn out all ten, that would be a time you could bring one of them. That would induce them to move up. You could put that right in the middle up top. Yeah, yeah. Okay. How the heck do you get bees anyway? There are a couple of ways. One is packaged bees. That's very, very common. There are millions and millions and millions of packaged bees that are sold in the United States every year. And basically, the way that works is you find a company that's selling packages. There's a lot of them. This is a very good company just over the border in New York State, in Greenwich, New York, so down near the Battenkill. Um, Better Bee. Um, you can buy package bees from them. This is one of the primary, probably the better of the two main bee journals in America. This is American Bee Journal. And there'll be ads for 30 different companies selling package bees in here. Package bees are the following. They tend to be raised in the south because they can get a, a big jump on the season. And these companies raise millions and millions of bees, and they raise queens. And when it's time to make the packages, you get this box that's about the size of a shoe box, but two sides are screened, two of the long sides are screened, and the rest of it is wood, thin wood. And they put a funnel in the opening. There's an opening this big in the top of the box. They put a funnel in there, and they shake in three pounds of bees. Then they take a queen, which is not related. It's not the mother of these bees. The queen is God knows where from. They raised it, uh, and she's mated. And they put the queen in a little cage, sc screened cage, uh, with half a dozen worker bees to be the attendants to feed her and groom her and give her water. And then they put, um, I should have brought a, brought a queen cage, and then they put a little piece of its fondant, so it looks like a marshmallow, but it's a little thicker, let's say. They shove that in one of the little holes in the queen cage and then put a cork over that. Then they suspend that queen in the package. She, it's not just sitting there floating around while the package is shipped. It's, it's like held in place. Yeah, it's Hold held in place. place. Um, and then they put in a can that holds about a pound of sugar syrup so the bees have something to drink on their trip north. And then they ship the bees north. They used to ship packages to um, Zone 5 in Vermont. Now they don't do that anymore. So for many, many years, I would order four packages of bees. And the post office would call me and say, your bees are here. Can you come and get them? Because inevitably, some of the bees wouldn't make it into the screened box. So when you get your packages, there's some bees that came all the way from Georgia that are on the outside of that box, which the post office isn't real happy about. So <laughs> nowadays, you can't get them shipped to Zone 5. Um, so, But there's a lot of companies that drive to Georgia with a semi, pick up 400 packages, bring them back north, and you just have to drive to pick them up at that destination. So if you ordered packages from Better Bee, that catalog, you're going to have to drive to Greenwich, New York to pick them up, that kind of deal. And then you would get the packages. You'd install one package in each box. Um, the queen is still in her cage. The reason she's in the cage is because since she's not related to the bees genetically, the bees would kill her. She's a foreigner. They would kill her. Immigration policy. <laughs> <laughs> Got to rise. <laughs> but there's one. Erase that. He, I didn't say that. Okay, we're not going there. <laughs> it's okay. We're all fishing too, so you're all right. <laughs> um, 
So then what's the deal with that little marshmallow-like stuff, the fondant? Well, when you then put the bees into the hive, you've shaken the bees out, they're in here. Now you take that queen in her cage, you take the little cork that's covering the fondant, and then you stick the queen in here so that the fondant is facing up. The bees, it'll take them two or three days to eat through the fondant. During that time, they will have gotten fully accustomed to the aroma of the queen, so they'll accept her. And even during the shipping time, they're still... They can, right. They're, I think yeah. during the shipping time, they're just holding on for dear life. <laughs> right. So that's how you install a package. And it's hard to visualize that whole process, I'm sure. So I'm sure, I've not tried this, but I'm sure if you went to YouTube, you could find multiple conflicting descriptions on how you <laughs> install a package. All right, so that's a common way. You buy a package, three pounds of bees, one queen, not related. The other thing you can do is buy a nucleus colony, also rather indelicately called a nuke. And a nuke means you're buying five frames that are all drawn out of bees and a queen. They are related. They're are all stages of bees in that little miniature hive. So nucleus basically meaning a little miniature hive. So you've got eggs, larvae, pupa that are all genetically related. You've got worker bees that are all genetically related. You've got a queen that's genetically related, right? That's also a very common way to do it. The best ones are the ones that are raised, in my opinion, on site. So if you're buying a nuke from a guy that takes his bees to South Carolina in the winter and makes up a bunch of nukes because he, the season is longer um, and then drives back to Vermont and sells them to you, it's not the end of the world. But if you buy nukes from the few people in Vermont who are raising them, you're buying northern queens that have shown that they can live through the climate. You're buying basically local bees. Right. So you're going to have all kinds of opinions from people about, do I want to buy packages? Do I want to buy nukes? It can go either way. They're each going to cost you roughly 100. A nuke's going to go for 150 bucks these days for five frames of bees. Um, and a package is 125 or so. So there's not really much of a difference between the two. So that's more or less personal preference. The, uh Better bee out of New York. Uh, are they getting their bees from South? They get them from the South. Too? Yes, so they are. More of a distributor. Uh, yes, yes, yes. They drive down and pick them up. They drive down and pick them up. And if you went VBA, Vermont Beekeepers Association, just two weeks ago, um, posted online a list of um, Vermont providers of nukes and packages. So you can go to the website and check that out if you're interested in, in that. It's, it doesn't mean they're all raised in Vermont, right. but it's, you can get packages from this guy who drives down to Georgia or Florida and drives back up. Right? There's, they're pretty much all over the state. OK. So where are we? OK, an interlude. How about this? OK, how many people have a cat? How many people have a dog? Okay. We all know when the cat or the dog is hungry, grouchy, sleepy, wants to go out. Isn't that incredible? Not really. But in a way, we speak English. They don't speak English. How come we know what they're telling us? I don't know, but we're able to communicate across species. You should see the bees if you want to see cross-species communication. Here's an example. Bees see ultraviolet light. We don't. <clears throat> the apple blossoms are out. OK, it's May. And all the wild apples, all the domestic apples, they're all out. When a bee has pollinated an apple blossom, the blossom turns darker. The tree is putting out a message to the bees saying, hey, I'm already pollinating. No, 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 don't waste your time. Don't come here, right? What's the benefit? 
Well, the tree wants every apple blossom pollinated. They don't want bees wasting time visiting ones that already got pollinated. The bees want as much pollen as they can because that's what their brood needs, right? So the bees don't want to be going to waste time on blossoms. So the blossom turns darker. Cross-species communication, anybody? It's unbelievable. When the bees visit a flower and drain the nectary, they leave a scent. The scent tells their sisters, hey, it's gone. Don't waste your time. The scent dissipates roughly at the same time that the nectary is filled again, right? These are those, I call them commonplace miracles of nature, the things that surround us that we're barely aware of but that are happening in millions of different ways all the time. And you know, our vision is so kind of coarse that we don't see those things. But this is, you know, if you want to talk about, all right, here's another thing. We're going to stay on this interlude, sorry. So we are those warm-blooded creatures, right? Insects are cold-blooded. OK, we know what that means. That means if it's 50 degrees outside, the bee is 50 degrees. If it's 70 degrees outside, the bee is 70 degrees. They're cold-blooded. Oh, yeah? Bees can increase their body temperature to over 100 degrees at will, right? So if you're a bee, all right, it's the end of January almost. Pretty soon, very soon, the queen is going to start laying eggs. How? I don't know. They can't see that the sun's rising earlier. They're in a black box. But the queen knows there's some kind of hardwiring DNA. She knows that it's time to start laying eggs. Wherever there's eggs, that little spot of brood nest is kept at 95 Fahrenheit 24-7, right? So we had 25 below in Heartland a couple weeks ago. I'm sure you had the same or colder here. Um, and it won't be unusual to get 10, 15, 20 below in February. Uh, that used to be routine. Maybe it's not so routine anymore. But definitely there's brood in February. Uh, those that brood is kept at 95 Fahrenheit. How do the bees do that? Well, pollen is protein. The brood requires pollen. Adult bees don't require pollen. They require carbohydrates, which is honey. So they consume the carbohydrates and convert it to heat. That's how they warm the brood nest. But they also are able to OK, so what do we mean the brood nest? So OK, so it's February, and there's this much brood on this frame, let's say. Some bees whose job description is that they are now warmer bees, they will unhinge their flight muscles and lay down on top of the open cell of egg or larva and vibrate their body really, really, really rapidly to create heat. Other bees will plunge themselves into cells adjacent to the open brood and do the same. They pulsate. You can, their abdomen is pulsating to create heat, right? So here's these insects that are supposedly cold-blooded who are doing that. The other thing the bees do, well, where's that strip frame? OK. How did they do this, anyway? Well, bees go through a series of job descriptions from the time they're born, right? As soon as they hatch, the first thing is, OK, clean your room already. So the first thing they do is they, they're, cle they're cleaning their own room, and then they go around and they're cleaning cells in readiness, polishing the cells so that the queen can now have fresh cells to lay in. That's their first job. They stay very close to the center of the brood nest. And gradually, over the course of their life, they are going a little bit further towards the perimeter. And when they're roughly three weeks old in the summer, spring and summer, then they will become field bees. And if they're lucky, they'll live another three weeks. And they'll be the ones that are gathering nectar and pollen and water. right? So they go through a series of job descriptions. First, they're cleaning up. 
Then they might be taking in nectar and pollen from the forager bees and depositing it in cells. They're feeding bees. Um, gradually then they're getting closer to the entrance of the hive. They might become guard bees um, who are keeping the hive safe by checking every bee's aroma that's coming in and only allowing in bees from their hive with some exceptions. Um, but at one point when they're, I don't know how old, I don't think it's much more than a week, they have um, glands on their belly, on their abdomen, from which they secrete wax. And then they manipulate the wax in order to build comb. Well, wax is either solid like this, it can be semi-crystalline, or it can be liquid. Well, when they build these hexagons, they need to have liquid wax. So these cold-blooded insects are able to raise their body temperature over 100 degrees. I think it might be 109. When they exude the wax plates from their abdomen, they melt it and they start on each side of the comb of the frame building comb. So there's bees here and there's bees here. So it's sort of like the Transcontinental Railroad when they did that one and then they pounded in that stake somewhere in Utah when they made the railway go across the country in the 1800s. The bees start here and here and somehow they wind up in the center and it all looks of one piece. When they melt the wax by raising their body temperature, the image that I read that really worked well was if you take two soap bubbles, they're round, that's their natural shape, but if they come together, they form a straight line. Well, the bees utilize that characteristic of physics or whatever it is when they build their hexagons. They take two adjacent wax and they put them together to form that straight line and eventually that's how they form their hexagon so that they, that's how they build their comb. So here again, we have these cold-blooded insects who are able to raise their temperature at will, depending upon what the task at hand is. There was a question that I was ignoring. Did you have a question, Beck? No? Um, go ahead. Um, I just was wondering, um, I guess, is the larvae that's doing the cleaning work? Or is no, that's the baby, the baby bees. bees. That's the adult bees. So it's the adult baby bees. It's, yeah, it's a hatched bee. So queen lays an egg. It looks like it's standing up in the bottom of the cell. It looks like a very miniature grain of rice, yeah. right? Um, come on. Five bucks, really good if I want to see what's going on. Um, after three days, the egg hatches and now it's a larva. Now it's laying down in the cell and it's shaped like the letter C and gradually it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and after another few days or so, the larva, so the egg becomes the larva which then becomes a pupa so it okay. spins a cocoon and that's when it's covered, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, and then that hatches and now that bee is a young adult and she'll clean the cells. So the larvae are being fed? Yeah, 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 like dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of time a day, okay? So the bees um, secrete enzymes from their, I think it's from their hypopharyngeal glands. Um, that's a lot of syllables. I would expect you to be a little more impressed, um, but it might not be the hypopharyngeal. <laughs> the bees add enzymes to the honey to, and, and pollen to, to make what's called bee bread, which is the nourishment that they feed to the larva. So, so all the larva are fed this bee bread. If the bees decide they need to make a new queen, they'll take a cell and just give it more of the bee bread. And that will then give it this supercharged nutrition so that they can make a queen. So if the bees, a worker takes 21 days from egg to hatching. A drone, the males, take 24 days, but a queen only takes 16 days. That's because she's on this very accelerated diet. Question? Do the, um, the 
the, does the current queen know that the workers are creating new queens? I will ask this spring. <laughs> Probably yes. Well, there's two ways the bees would create a new queen. If, okay, so the queen is putting out pheromones that are saying to the colony, I'm here, I'm well, smell me. The, the queen is not feeding herself or grooming herself. Worker bees are doing that, right? And then they're passing her scent on to other bees, so it's spread through the hive, so the bees feel like, okay, all is good, I can smell her, it's all good. If the colony gets too populous, essentially that means the queen's pheromone is diluted. They're not getting as much sense of it. And so some bees basically just change their job description, and instead of becoming forager bees going for nectar and pollen, they become house hunting bees. And they say, now it's time to swarm. We're so strong that we're going to divide our gene pool and spread it out somewhere. And we're going to create our own declaration of independence. That's right. That's right. So in that case, the bees would take, it's usually several eggs. Um, there could be 20 or more and they will make swarm cells. They almost always are along the bottom of a frame near the brood, in the brood chamber. And you can tell a swarm cell because it looks like a peanut. It's that long, uh, unmistakable. You know, it's, early on it might be easy to confuse a drone cell which has a slight um, capping that's higher than the than the plane of the frame. Um, and you'll say, oh, that must be a swarm cell. It, no, soon enough when you see a real swarm cell, they're big because it's got to hold the whole queen. So you'll see all those swarm cells along the bottom. The queen knows they're there, but she also knows that before they hatch, she is taken off with half the bees. So if your, swarm, if your colony swarms, you've just lost half your bees you've probably lost half or more of your honey crop too. It's a wonderful thing for the bees because it spreads their genetic map, right? So it is a good thing for the bees. That's swarming. No beekeeper particularly likes it. I'm trying to train myself to like it, and sometimes I can fool myself into thinking that I like it, but if I can capture a swarm, that's a wonderful, wonderful feeling. Um, so that's swarming. The other time the bees are going to create queens is if they feel like their resident queen isn't pulling her weight, right? The, Out of the golf the, course, you know, you just can't pay attention to the, But the brood pattern is no good. Um, she's not laying a lot of workers, whatever. If the bees feel like their existing queen is not up to the job, they kill her, but first they take eggs that she's laid, feed them that special diet, and they make different kind of cell. It's called the supersedure cell. They're superseding the queen. Those cells always are in this part of the frame. If you see cells down here, those are swarm cells. Your colony's going to swarm. Once they're there, it's very, very, very unlikely that you'll be able to change their mind. They've already made up their mind, basically. The cells are evidence and there's nothing you can do about it. Supersedure cell means we're getting, this queen ain't working, she's not doing a good job, we're killing her and we're going to start with a new one. Whether or not the queen knows that those supersedure cells are there, I don't know the answer. Question? Um, it might happen, but when it's time for the bees to swarm, it is one of the most fascinating acts of, have you ever seen a swarm? Yeah. It's extraordinary, isn't it? It looks like this immense amount of chaos. There's, it's a cloud of bees. Yeah. They always go 
I don't know, three or four feet higher than my highest ladder. That seems to be. <laughs> no, seriously, when you see a swarm of bees, it's, it's, it'll strike fear in your heart, but it's the safest thing of all because the bees are leaving with their queen. They've chased her around on the comb for a few days before swarming because they wanted to lose weight so that she can fly. Then they give a message. Some bees start piping and kind of butting up against other bees, saying, come on, start your engines. We're getting ready. And then those bees give the same message. And then usually late morning, early afternoon on a sunny day, um, you'll see this cloud of bees that looks like chaos. It looks like the end of the world. And it looks like, oh my god, I'm going to be stung a thousand times. It's one of the most peaceful times of all for the bees because they've engorged on honey so that when they get to their next home, they have something to start making wax with and building a home. And they're with their queen. So they're very, very docile, actually. And I had an extraordinary experience a few years ago. <coughs> I had a swarm down near my garden on this locust post that was holding um, a wire around raspberry bushes. And the swarm was low, which was great. So they usually they'll go to a resting place. And then they actually have a town meeting um, to decide where their real next home is going to be. So the and scouts are going out looking, right? Coming scouts back. are going out looking, yeah. coming back, and then saying to their sisters, yeah, I didn't find such a great place. Somebody else is coming back and said, you won't believe this place. So depending on, upon the alacrity of the returning house hunters, they will attract others to go and verify that, yeah, that site looks pretty good. They're going to take measurements of the opening. They're going to take measurements of the volume inside. They're going to take all kinds of measurements of the house. Then they'll come back and they'll say to their sisters, this place is great. Check it out. And finally, the bees decide based on how many votes went for this site compared to this site compared to this site, they'll decide where they're going to go. But generally, they first will congregate someplace. Usually, you can see it from the hive they left. Um, and often, it's high, but it, it's not that uncommon for it to be on a fence or on a bush or something. So I had a swarm that was around this post. What did I do? I went and I got a hive body with frames in it. I put an old sheet on the ground right by the post. I put the hive body close. And then I took a bee brush and actually I held the, the, fr the, the hive body under the frame. And then I just started brushing the bees into the box. Well, if you get the queen into the box, all is good. The rest of the bees will follow. If you don't, these bees are out and they're right back here. So this was in a location where I really couldn't do that brushing. So I put the hive next to it with a sheet. And I just got down on my knees. And I was really placid. And I just started brushing my way through into the internal part of the swarm, just kind of pushing bees out of the way. I had on those, I had on these gloves. This is what a lot of beekeepers wear. They're just sort of the thing you wash dishes with, because the bees, you can get stung, but they're much more sensitive than these big clunky gloves that most beekeepers wear that infuriate the bees because you're always banging frames and all this stuff. So anyway, what all, I'm in the middle of the swarm, and I see the queen. I reach in. She's gone. So OK, I'll try it again. I was feeling super peaceful, so it was very out of characteristic. So then <laughs> I keep on brushing through, brushing through, brushing through. About 15 minutes later, I see the queen. She's gone. My wife starts coming down towards the garden, and I'm brushing through again. And when she gets close, I say, honey, I think I'm going to have to let nature take its course. Um, this swarm is gone. And at that moment, I saw the queen 
for the third time. I'll take a polygraph on this, I promise. This really happened. I saw the queen, I picked her up, put her in the hive, every bee turned around and marched right in. It was unbelievable. That's what I said. <laughs> that's right. That's, wow. what, that's what I said. So it was so easy, so not dramatic that they landed in a lilac bush. And the only challenge was I was on a ten foot step ladder on a slope like this. Yeah. Use milk crates under a couple of legs of the step ladder uh -huh. to lose it. Yeah. Didn't have time so I didn't know how long it was gonna be there. Didn't suit up. I went up there nothing but shorts. I didn't know they were docile. I'm I'm a dead man, right? <laughs> and I go up there with a pair of loppers and hold on to the branch my teeth and cut the branch with the lockers and, and then grab that branch and come down the step ladder. And then just shook it into and the I hive. swarm box and I just shook it into the swarm box and <laughs> <laughs> But it was easy, it was made, yeah. I mean, it wasn't any skill. It was yeah. just like, <laughs> they picked a good place for me. So yes, like exactly. I, I was lucky. That's great, right? And did you all get stung? No, not once. <laughs> Not once. And not, not the same thing. No. They, they, or actually, some of them had covered my body, and I'm starting to feel a little tense. Yeah. But as soon as I decided either I'm dead or I'm not, there's nothing I can do with this That's right. That's right. I, 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 they started, after they were in the swarm box, they started leaving, not all at once, but quite a few. They left me alone. I just did this little jump like this. Yeah. The rest of them fell off and left. Yeah. Last summer, um, there was a neighbor called and said that there was a swarm on a tree, um, and I assumed it was from me. So my son was visiting with his two grandsons, so we went over to check it out, and it wasn't that big, but it was there. I said, well, yeah, I'll try to get it. And so I went back and got just some stuff, a little box to put him in and all this, and my son was um, filming it on his phone, and his two-year-old son was like, you know, right under the bees, all around the bees and all this stuff. And I got the swarm and there's a lot of bees in the air because I'm shaking it into the box. And my grandson is just kind of, you know, like this. And I was sure social services was gonna find out. <laughs> My son put it, he uploaded it to wherever they do these things. And, so. and the grandson didn't get stung? No, no. He wasn't afraid. And the bees he, didn't know any, he didn't know any better, <laughs> right? So anyway, um, we should talk about pests, I think. That's an important topic. Go ahead, please. Wait, can you talk a moment about splitting your hive? Yeah, sure. Uh, splitting a hive, it used to be that beekeepers would commonly split a hive in the spring. When they're starting to build up really well, break them in two. That's going to A, reduce the tendency of swarming, B, give you two hives instead of one. You just saved a lot of money. You might buy a queen and have that ready so you can install that queen in the split part that doesn't have a queen or you can let the bees raise their own queen as long as there's eggs in that split, then they can turn the eggs into a, a queen. If you do that, it takes f roughly 49 days, so like seven weeks, until you're gonna see any bees hatching. Because the, the bees have to turn that into a queen, that's 16 days, then the queen hangs out in the hive, then she goes on her mating flight, then she comes back, and when she starts laying eggs, it's 21 days until a worker hatches. So if you let the bees raise a queen, um, it's seven weeks, which in our climate, we don't have that many weeks. So getting a, another queen, which you can buy queens in the mail from Hawaii if you want, um, having a queen on site is probably a good idea. So a lot of beekeepers will split their hives in the spring. Other beekeepers say, this is a really good hive. I want this hive to make honey. If I split it, what am, why would I split a good hive? Right? It's still very common. What's becoming very common is a technique that I think was popular in the 19th century and then basically vanished when they started raising package bees in the south, and that is making baby nucleus colonies in June and getting them strong enough to overwinter. 
Um, there are some very, very good Vermont beekeepers who do this with great success. So instead of taking the good, strong colonies that are going to make honey for you, they take the mediocre colonies and they say, OK, I'm going to take two frames of brood out of this one, one frame of honey out of it. I'll take another two frames out of this one. And then they'll start, and it'll be a box this size, but it'll have a divider board right down the center so you can fit four frames on each side, right? And then you start with a frame with brood in all phases, two frames of brood, one frame of honey, and one frame of either foundation or drawn comb. You do that on each side. So now you have two four-frame nukes. You probably bought queens for them. And it's becoming successful. There are beekeepers in Vermont who are getting hundreds of nucleus colonies through the winter in four frames, which seems counterintuitive because what about needing all those bees to keep everything warm? Well, it's working. The bees seem to know how to adapt to the chamber size that they're in, which is why I think a lot of beekeepers are going back to having two deeps for the year-round home and not that medium on top, because have them a little more concise, and they'll adapt to that size. So increasing your colonies by making your own nukes in June, very common. Um, one thing I didn't mention earlier, so we're going to go all the way back to the first minute that we were here. One thing that Vermont Beekeepers Association does is it maintains two bee yards, a north yard, which is at the Intervale in Burlington, and the South Yard, which is in Escutney um, in the southeast. And there are six free workshops that are offered starting in April, one per month through September, that go through the whole cycle of the beekeeper's year. So it starts with spring cleaning, spring evaluation, <coughs> reversal. It goes through how to install packages, how to install nukes. It, um, every aspect of beekeeping, right through to harvesting honey, treating for mites, winterizing the bees. So there's six of them. If you go to the VBA site, the schedule will be there. Um, I teach the ones in Escutney with a good friend, Bill Taft, who between us we have like, I don't know, closing in on 80 years between us. Um, and we don't always agree. Bill does it this way, I do it that way. But these classes can be wonderful way to learn about bees. So you might want to check out the site on that. And that one of the things we do is we make up nukes in June, the four frame nukes. So Thank you. you're welcome. Just a quick question. What days of the week do you do this? Saturdays, 1 to 3. OK. Yeah. yeah. I'm not sure of the North Yard schedule, but I think those are Saturdays also. Yeah. Yes? Before you move on to pests, I read um, in a beekeeping book that bees will make poison honey from rhododendrons and azaleas? Yes. And I have a yard full of them. So do I have to get a bucket loader and get rid of all of those, or will they choose other things first, or am I just going to have a mix of? I would probably, if I answered now, I don't think I would feel confident in my answer. So I would look a little more deeply into that. Um, there was something that we had on, on the VBA side, a kind of ask the experts kind of thing. Mike Palmer is a great beekeeper in Vermont, and um, he would likely know what's the best thing to do. But yeah, azalea honey is poison, um, poison and rhododendron. Humans. Yeah. Or poison to humans, yeah. Or Certainly poison toxic, to the rest of the hive. You find out more. I know it's a no-no for honey. The thing to keep in mind is that most honey that we get in Vermont is from a great, great variety of sources. So even if they were getting nectar from rhododendrons for two weeks, probably the finished honey is going to be comprised of dozens, if not hundreds, of different floral sources. So it might be fine. But I would definitely look into that if you've got a lot of rhododendrons. Right? Yes. Uh, well, the, the queen starts laying, and they start expanding. And that existing comb that's already there? 
oh yes, yes, th so this comb here is, that's, I don't know, I'd say probably at least 20 years old, maybe more. Um, so yeah, they'll reutilize the comb year after year, which is good because they don't have to put out the effort every year to be drawing all that comb. They can make honey instead, right? Any other questions? So you're starting brand new. Mm-hmm. You have your boxes set up. When do you order? What's your goal for yeah. starting? Um, because beekeeping is much more popular now than it's been, certainly since I started keeping bees, you want to order as soon as possible. So if you're really sure you want to start this year, I would order bees now, either packages or um, nucleus colonies. So I would go online and, well, I'd go to the VBA site and look for that list that we just uploaded, which is where you can get bees in Vermont. And there were probably 20 different names on that list, so there are options. But if you're going to get bees this spring, it's really important that you have the area where they're going to live ready. The equipment is all built, um, painted, ready to go. Um, you don't want to be catching up to the bees. You want to be one step ahead. And now we'll get into the pest thing. Do you have a question, sir? Yeah. What about marrying a weak hive? Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, which is, um, when I pulled this box out of my shed, I noticed that there was some newspaper visible that was stuck to the bottom. Because if you have a weak hive and a mediocre hive, you might say, neither one is going to make honey. But if I join them, they might be strong enough to make honey. So you simply take the weaker of the two, you bring it over to the stronger. Let's say this is the stronger. You take off the outer cover and the inner cover, so you're left with nine or 10 frames like that. You put a sheet of newspaper over this. You might make a couple slits in the newspaper, but it's not critical. Then you take the other weak hive, and you put it on top of the newspaper, put on your inner and outer cover. The bees chew through the newspaper, but it takes long enough so that by the time they've done so, they've become accustomed to each other's odors. If you didn't use the newspaper, you'd have a big fight on your hands. But with the newspaper, um, they, they accept each other. Yeah. Then one queen kills the other. Now with that weak hive, I got about two hives. One hive seemed to do it fine after a week. The, the queen was on the ground outside. Oh, no. So what comes? Dead? No, alive. I tried getting on a stick, tried putting it back inside. I put her on the perch. Yep. And it, would, it wouldn't go back inside. Eventually, was that a package? It was a package. The bees might not have accepted her. Yeah. She wouldn't, you know, I tried for like a half hour. Wow. I just didn't, finally, I left to go get suit on, and when I came back, she was gone, or I couldn't find her. She might have gotten a draft, but she wasn't inside. What did you do with the hive after that? Pardon? What did you do with the hive after that? That's the weak one that I, I eventually I tried marrying it. Newspaper and, method? Yeah, I used newspaper. And it, it seemed to take, but the hive didn't really, I did get about 10 pounds of honey at the end of the suit. What time of year did you did, unite um, them? That I, that I harvested. That you united? Um, Probably mid June. Mid June? Maybe a little later. Because I didn't realize I couldn't find it. <clears throat> well, do you know if there was any brood in the in the hive where the queen was out front? Really keen on Yeah. Uh, if there if the queen were bad enough that they just um, kicked her out and there wasn't brood, then you were just adding bees, which is not a bad thing, to the other hive. Yeah. If you were adding brood then that would be even better for the other hive. What yeah. Happens to a hive uh, what happens to, okay, you want more magic? Okay, so <laughs> the queen puts out all these pheromones. And when she's strong, one of the pheromones suppresses 
the worker bee's ability to lay eggs. If the queen dies and there's no eggs that the bees can now turn into a new queen to rescue the colony, now there's no pheromone and some of the worker bees now develop the ability to lay eggs. The problem is they never went to that singles bar, <laughs> right? So they never got fertilized. So all they can lay is drones, unfertilized eggs. Now you've got what's called a drone laying colony or, well, leave it at that. And that colony's doomed because it can't lay workers. You can tell when you have a drone laying colony or a laying worker colony. Sometimes queens don't mate well and they just lay drones too. Um, so that can be another cause. But if you have a laying worker colony, you can tell because the worker's abdomens aren't as long as the queen's and so they can't get to the bottom of that cell. So they all have eggs that are sticking out halfway up the cell where they deposit them. That's as far as they can reach and they usually lay multiple eggs in a cell. That plus they're cranky, um, but they feel like they have a queen. So you can't just take a new queen and put it in there because they're going to say, wait, we already got a queen and they're going to kill her. So work, laying workers, it's not that common, but it ain't fun. Yeah. OK, pests. Go ahead. <coughs> when we put out our uh, in the spring. Oh, yeah, the bees love it, don't they? Oh, they end it. Yeah. Hours. Yeah. Well, they'll, it's not bad for the hives. It's very low sugar concentration, right? Um, sugar water is very commonly fed to bees for, at various times of year for various reasons. And so they're just saying, cool, there's, they'll also, they'll go into bird feeders and pick out little bits of duff from the sunflower seeds that they, it's not pollen, but they, somehow they think maybe this is a good thing. So neighbors will call and say, hey, I got bees all over my bird feeders. No, it shouldn't harm the hive, no. No. I was like no. sweating, but that's okay. No. But they, they went in and out of the holes. I stood there and I watched them like take a number. They actually were <laughs> waiting the turn. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, for a couple hours, that full feeder was empty. Yeah. Well, it was amazing to see that. That would also be an indication that you should have been feeding the bees, right? So if you have a mild day in March, April, and there's not much yet coming in, there's a lot of brood that needs feeding. The brood nest is expanding. The population is expanding. This is a really dangerous time of year because they can run out of food and starve. Mm -hmm. So that's when you're going to give, you know, some beekeepers will say, well, I'm not going to give any sugar water to my bees. Well, it's one thing to take every drop of honey out and now feed the bees sugar syrup to keep them alive. It's another thing to say, OK, they're low on stores and either I feed them sugar water or I watch the bees die. That's your call. I feed bees when they need to be fed, personally. And if you were seeing that at your feeder, that's when you should be feeding. Well, it depends. In the spring, you'd feed one-to-one -one sugar syrup, equal weights. Um, and that will stimulate brood rearing, right? Um, if you're feeding to bulk them up, like it's like, in, you know, you lifted the back of your hive and September, and it's like, oh, it's pretty light. Maybe I should feed them. Then you're going to feed two to one, two parts sugar to one part water. Um, and that, they'll pack that into their cells. And that will, they can live on that. And it's, to see a colony of bees in the spring that's dead is really, really, really sad. And it's not that uncommon. New Hampshire lost 75% of their bees last winter. It was a tough winter. Uh, in, in Vermont, it wasn't much better. It was very mild in February. The bees got active. Mm -hmm. March got really cold. 
So at least a couple of my colonies, the bees, they cluster all winter, right? And they move up as a unit to access their stores of honey. Well, when it got warm, small little groups broke off to get to the honey, and then it got cold, they couldn't get back in. And so when bees starve, what happens is you'll see them all head first in the cells, and they have basically licked out the last bit of honey and then croaked. And there was a lot of die off this spring because of that, last spring. So it's always good, you know, if it's a mild day in February, I'm checking out my bees. Usually what I do, it's my sort of ritual, New Year's Day, I go out to my hives, put my ear on them, wrap it. I want to see what kind of response I'm getting. Am I getting a really strong response? Am I getting silence? So I want to know, just from the response, roughly how populous is the colony. And I also want to know how high up are they in the column, right? If it looks like they're already at the top, I might take one of the bricks on top of the hive and stand it up. That's a note to myself. This one needs to be checked as soon as possible. Then if there's a day in the 40s and sunny and not a lot of wind, I can quickly take off the outer cover. And if I see bees right up at the top, it's like, good. <laughs> they're not going back down there. If there's any honey at all, they're not going for it. They need emergency feed or they're going to die. So I, you, in February, you're going to start looking on a mildish day in February to see what's going on. And by all means, feed them because, yeah, we do have an emotional attachment. We don't so want to see them dead. How do you feed them then, right then? Um, you shouldn't give them liquid, like honey the syrup dish then. On top of the, um, no, the you feed sugar water in like <clears throat> ball jars. Um, I have gallon jars that I use. Um, but if there's too much moisture in the hive, they can get dysentery. So emergency feeding in February, you're better off using something that's much thicker. You can buy what's called winter patties. You can make winter patties. It's water, sugar, and some pollen substitute. And that's, that's a good choice because it's not really, really liquid. It's almost a suet or something. It's about that consistency. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, you put it right above the bees so they can access it. And so you wouldn't switch the boxes? No. No. Okay. No. And about shoveling, keeping the boxes shoveled so they don't suffocate? No. Um, you're going to have in the winter, <clears throat> I wrap my hives in tar paper. I put half inch hardware cloth across the front. Half inch is big enough for a bee to carry out a dead bee. But a mouse can't get in. Right? Mice will go in there and really do a number on your comb. They'll really screw up your frames. So you kill you, the whole colony. Yeah. Or the bees might kill the mouse, but you're still going to lose a lot, of, a lot of frames. You won't be able to use anymore. So that's one of the pests is mice. So you have a mouse guard, and half-inch hardware cloth is the easiest. Well, now you've got zero degrees out, and this is this amount of opening. Yeah, the cold doesn't harm the bees. Moisture harms the bees. So a method I learned from Steve Paris, who's a great Vermont beekeeper. He was the apiary inspector for Vermont up until a couple of years ago when he retired. And the method he uses, and this is what I use all the time too, <clears throat> um, on the top box, on the, the, highest, the higher box of two or three, whatever you have, you put a half, a two inch piece of blueboard insulation and the back side of the blue board, if it's two inches, you've notched out maybe an inch, and you go in about maybe three inches. So you've got this little channel here. That goes right above the inner cover with that channel in the back. Okay? And that way, air goes through the hive. The moist air is then funneled up through the inner cover hole and out that channel. Get rid of the moist air. Some beekeepers put an empty super on top of their brood chambers that's filled with wood chips or sawdust to gather the moisture. I don't like doing that because I don't want the moisture in the hive. I want to get it out of the hive, but that was a very common method. But I do Steve Paris's method, and then the inner cover notch becomes the winter entrance. 
So you've got the blue board here with the outer cover on top of the blue board. You've got the, this here so that when the bottom, when the opening is full of snow, the bees still have access to get out. That's the wintering. All right, so we talked about yeah, that would be this. Expect that it's going to be winter. A lot of beekeepers also put a three-quarter inch hole on their brood chamber boxes, not their honey supers. I do that. That's just another way for the bees to come in and out. Right? But I also cover the hives with tar paper, not covering down to the bottom here, but right to here, um, but not covering this. And that just means that on the kind of shoulder days, if it's sunny, It'll be a little warmer in the hive. They can move more easily to access their stores. OK, so it's 10 of 12. So I do want to talk about, we mentioned mice. Skunks can do a number on your hive. Skunks can eat a pound of bees per night. Uh, you'll know you have skunks if you see scratch marks on the hive. Um, what they do is they come out at night, they scratch on the hive. The guard bees go out to say, what's going on here? And the skunks grab them and eat them, right? So some bees make, some beekeepers um, keep their hives off the ground enough so the skunks have to stand up, which exposes their belly, which is very vulnerable. And then they won't molest your hive. Um, other beekeepers use what's called a nail board, and they just take a board, a two by six or something, and just pound 50 nails into it and leave that right in front of the hive, right? Um, or if you have an electric fence, what I do is I keep one low wire on the electric fence to keep the skunks out. Bees that are, colonies that are molested by skunks become very, very, very cranky, really hard to work because they're really mad and they'll let you know it. So skunks can be a danger, Bear. will be a danger, unless you're in downtown Montpelier or yeah, down. They, right they do? Here. OK, yeah. good. So to start one colony of bees, just the equipment, I didn't even show you a smoker yet, <coughs> just the equipment and the bees and the gear, you're talking, I don't know, Three, four, 300 bucks maybe, something like that, probably more than 300 bucks. Uh, but if you don't have a bear fence, sooner or later, the bears are going to get your bees. Mm -hmm. And you, you know what a number they'll do. So they don't care. The, bear, the voltage in the fence isn't enough to bother them. So what you do is you put up your bear fence, which is going to cost you another 200 bucks. Make it big enough for expansion because, you know, beehives are like tractors. The one you first bought ain't big enough. <laughs> it's, the same, it's the same with the bees. You start with one colony, and then you got a swarm. Oh my gosh, now I have two. And then it's like, wow, two is great. I want four. Well, make sure your bear fence is big enough to accommodate what you think you're going to get. And then go buy some really bad bacon. Don't let your neighbors see, but buy it, and then you're going to wrap it around the wires of the bear fence, you know, you don't have to put 100 of them, but you'll put, you know, 10 or 15 pieces of bacon around there. And then the bear is either going to put his nose or his tongue on the bacon. That hurts. If you didn't have that, they'll walk right through a bear fence that, with that fur. That's not going to deter them. So when you say bear fence, you mean an electric, electric fence? Oh, okay. yeah. just a Uh, well, I have one fence, oh. and so it's so far so good. I mean, I definitely have had bears on my property frequently. This is how you work your bees. You'll have a smoker, have something to cover the hole when you're done. And then um, when you smoke modestly, not aggressively, modestly, then the bees tend to go down or they move away from where the smoke is so you can expose a frame and pick up that frame for inspection. Um, there's all kinds of fuel you can buy for your smoker. Personally, I start with pine needles. That'll start a good, quick, hot fire. And then I, I'll get it going well. And then I put in. 
sumac. I'll bust this up into four or five pieces. Sumac will burn long and cool. You can have a fire going for an hour if you're using sumac. If you just use pine needles, it goes out quickly and it's a hot flame so it can burn the bee's wings, right? So it's a good way to start the fire. You can buy all kinds of stuff. Some people use burlap, that's okay too. Um, last I checked, um, the amount that I've spent on pine needles and sumac has been zero dollars and zero cents, and I kind of like that very much. So, and they work very, very well. So that's, it's up to you, but I would recommend something like that simply for the, the lack of expense. One, just, two, three. First, Go ahead. I just add something to that, that when you get your smoker going, smoke your hand. You'll know whether you're going to hurt your feet Good or point. Not. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Are there any plants that bees particularly like? Oh, there are a multitude of plants that bees like. Yeah. They, the list is so long. And eventually, if you keep bees, your area, you'll get to know the cycle of the seasons. If you have a garden, which I assume everybody here does, you'll be <clears throat> astonished at how it is changed from the presence of the bees. Um, like w our asparagus, when it goes, when we let the ferns grow up, there will be hundreds and hundreds of bees in the asparagus flowers in like July, August. It's breathtaking, right? Um, you will be stung. Um, it's probably a good thing. It's probably good for your immune system. Like every time you work with the bees? No, gosh, no, no, no. When you start out, you're going to be stung a lot. And in a sense, it's a good thing because you're going to be too rough until you learn how to be gentle. Hopefully you'll be able to, you know, take some of the beekeeping classes that are free and watch somebody who's got experience how they do it. Um, but you're going to look into your bees more than you should when you're starting out. But you have to do that so that you can learn a lot of the more subtle keys of how the colony's doing. So expect that that's sort of a process. And then as you get more experienced, you know, I, I talk about sitting here falling asleep. Well, I'm not exaggerating, but what am I doing while I'm here? I'm watching the bees and I'm listening. You can tell a lot about the bees by what the sound is coming from the hive. You'll know peaceful, happy bees and you'll know agitated bees. It's so clear once you learn it. You'll know how the hive is doing by seeing, oh, look at all that pollen coming in. Oh, this is buff colored. So it must be this. Oh, look at that. It's bright yellow. It must be that. You'll know in your area the different plants that are blooming if you're focused on seeing what color pollen and matching that to the floral source. And I'll look at my bees in April for a spring inspection. I'll look at them again once or twice in May, see if they're building up well, see if the, how the brood pattern is, see if they're making any ideas about swarming. May is a big swarm season for us. But if, once I start putting supers on, really an inspection for me is I might pull the inner cover off. If I see white wax near the top bars, well, what does that mean? Well, white wax is wax that the bees haven't walked all over, so it's fresh wax. So I'll say, oh, there's white wax on five of those frames. Good, time for another super. I don't have to pull frames and be looking way down here if, if the hive is this big. So I try to have a, a hands-off attitude once I've confirmed that this colony looks like it's in pretty good shape and I don't think swarming is an issue. But when you're starting out, yeah, you're going to be going in there every 10 days and just saying, all right, today I want to see if I can find eggs. Today I want to see the difference between capped drone brood and capped worker brood. Now I've got to see if there's any supersedure cells or swarm cells. So expect to get stung. And I don't know. I think more, depending on what energy I'm bringing to the hive is going to determine how that sting feels. And I know that sounds kind of woogie, but if I'm feeling kind of mellow and just sort of in the groove for that particular moment, a sting is like, OK. And if I'm feeling a little uptight, then it's going to 
So it's so. a measure of how uptight you are is how bad that sting is. That's right. Um, one thing I wanted to mention, that I, I, I don't know how many other people in the room might be allergic <clears throat> to sumac staghorns, but I know it's not an incredibly rare allergy. Um, it, 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 for some people. Stag, stag staghorn horn. sumac? Uh, yeah, the su sumac. Not poison sumac, but staghorn sumac. Well, the, They're different. OK, well, that looked like a staghorn, what you had there. It is. OK. It's not, that's not poison sumac. You could take that staghorn and brush it on me, and I might end up in the hospital. No kidding. Uh, and it's, uh, I, I thought it was kind of odd, because I, I had played the poison ivy as a kid. Wow. Um, and it didn't bother me. And so I went to a dermatologist. Let me rub this on you. <laughs> OK. <laughs> um, and the dermatologist explained to me that you have certain wild cards for allergies, that everybody uh -huh. has allergies. And it's a matter of how much repeated exposure you yeah. have or don't have. Oh. And so it's a fair chance that I've had more than my share yeah. exposed to that. Yeah. But the allergy to that, if you have it, yeah, good is to know. I never knew that. Outrageous. Okay. Uh, if you're lucky and you notice it first, you wash it real well and go with yeah. topical. Um, yeah. Uh, what's that? Benadryl cream. Yeah. Then maybe you won't end up needing. Uh, Thank any you. Medical attention. Thank you. So I, just to... I know we're getting close to the end, but I want to ask about viruses. We hear yeah. a lot about. Yeah. That. Can you say we have to talk about varroa mites. These are those mm -hmm. things that bees coexisted in Kazakhstan and all these places in eastern Russia for millennia. And they had a peaceful coexistence. They made it to North America in 87, I think it was, and everything changed. Beekeeping was laissez-faire for a lot of years. When I started out in 82, it was like, yeah, you have a colony of bees. They're going to live for 10 years. Uh, when the mites came, First, they were tracheal mites. A couple of years later, varroa mites. Tracheal aren't much of an issue anymore. But varroa mites are a death sentence if you have too many. You will have varroa mites. Um, maybe not your first year. It's kind of like you might not see cucumber beetles your first year. But you'll definitely get them by year two. Um, the varroa mites, <sighs> more miracles in nature. The varroa mites know the difference between drone brood and worker brood. They know that the drone brood is capped for three days longer, or they know something. But the drone brood is three days longer as a pupa. And the varroa prefer to go into the drone cells because they have more opportunity to mate. So they go into the drone cell, and they um, basically perform incest with a sibling. And then now you've got two of them. And then they will rise exponentially right at the time when the bee population has tapered off and is starting to taper. And they will kill your bees outright because um, they suck the hemoglyph, I think is the word, but they'll suck the juices out of, out of the larva or the adult bee. Um, and they're vectors for all kinds of viruses. So if they don't kill the bees directly, they're carrying viruses that will kill the bees. So I got out of beekeeping for a few years because the first treatments for varroa were these super heavy organophosphate chemicals, mm -hmm. kumaphos and flu fluvalinate. And I just didn't want that in my soil. I didn't want that in my equipment. So I got out of it. Now there are a number of organic treatments even they're not USDA certified organic, but they are based on thymol and eucalyptus, or they're based on hops or formic acid. And there are treatments that are easy to apply and very effective. And to me, it's like a bear fence. You don't have a bear fence, your bees are going to get wiped out. You don't treat for varroa. Sooner or later, you're going to lose all your bees. One of the challenges now is there's these things that are called varroa bombs. And basically, it's like, oh, I want to save the bees. You can tell because I have this bag that says, save the bees. And I have a t-shirt that says, I love bees. So of course, I just want to save the bees. So I'm going to get a colony of bees. And then it just sits there. And it uh, is not maintained. It's not inspected. And drones are accepted in any colony. Right? Workers are not. The guard bees are checking the aroma of bees as they come in and out. And they're not going to let foreign workers in. <coughs> but any drone can go anywhere, any colony. So your neighbor who loves the bees so much that they buy t-shirts, 
they don't treat their bees, that colony is full of varroa mites, drones go into that colony, come back and infect your colony. So that's a real problem. So if you do keep bees, I urge you not to just say, good, I'm going to put them in in May, and then I'll just come back in September and harvest the honey. It doesn't work that way. It's got to be an active engagement, and you have to figure out your strategy for dealing with varroa mite. You can start checking for them in May or June. It's easy to check while you're checking your colony um, to see if you have mites. See what the threshold is. You know, you should have no more than three mites per 100 bees. I think that's now the recommended threshold, three per 100. Can you actually see them? You can see them. What you do is, this is called a capping scratcher, but it's a very, very effective tool that what you do is, pretend this is that frame that had the drone brood down here. I don't want to be killing my workers, but the drone, now it's capped drone brood. I'll go under it with this, and then I'll pry it up and expose all the white larvae, and I'll see the mites. They're going to be these little dark specks, <coughs> kind of a dark russet color, and I'll see the mites. That's the quickest way to do it, right? I can just take jiffy checks to check. By, and you're going to kill that brood. Uh, the bees will eat that larva. So at least you're giving them some protein. But that's a very important thing to do um, as the season progresses. There's another slightly more elaborate method that's called a sugar roll, where you take a half a cup of bees, which is supposed to total, I can't remember how many bees that totals, and then you um, put it in a container, a ball jar basically with a mesh lid, and um, confection of sugar and shake it like crazy for about a minute and then leave it off to the side in the shade for a few minutes and the bees heat up. And when they get above a certain temperature, the drones fall off them. And once you've done that, then you, you shake, the mites fall off them. You shake the mites into a white bucket so you can see them and count them. And um, then the other bees you can put them back right back in the hive so you haven't killed them, but you freaked them out big time. <laughs> and then their sisters will clean off the sugar. That's the sugar roll test. So but you're saying you'd be that? prophylactically treating them, right? Pardon me? You'd be prophylactically treating You're not treating. You're simply getting an assessment of the level of infestation. But why would you just prophylactically treat your... Oh, I see what you mean. You certainly could do that. A lot of beekeepers do it. I do that too. Other people would say, well, that's like just saying, take some antibiotics in case, mm -hmm. right? Eventually, it's not good. So if you use a treatment that's 97% effective against mites, that's like, oh my god, 97%, that's incredible. Mm -hmm. Guess what? 3% of the mites are resistant. They're the ones that are going to then become one step ahead of the treatments, right? I treat prophylactically. I always treat my bees for mites. Every year? Um, oh, yeah, yeah, right after I harvest honey. So you're not having this resistance issue? Yes, you're not. <laughs> Probably not, yeah. right? And I think I would advise, and other beekeepers would say, no, it's not good advice, but I think I would advise everybody to treat prophylactically against varroa. Yeah. So what um, I usually use something called Mitaway Quick Strips, which is based on formic acid. Sometimes, though, I like to rotate it with another treatment. So I might use something that's called Apolife Var, which is based on thyme and eucalyptus. And the principle for all these treatments is you're going to put something in the hive that's strong enough to kill the mites, but not so strong to kill the bees. Mm. Right. right? The rotation. And the rotation. Rotation is probably a good idea. Yeah. yeah. So because if there is some residual um, alive. Treatment, if it's different, might take them out, right? Right. So if you're having to treat a couple times, some of the treatments you need to give two applications. Right. But if you can do two applications and you still need to treat, then you were not ahead of the curve. Yeah, but what I'm saying is like your year. Yeah. If you change your, right. your chemical. That's what I tend to do, yeah. You're yeah. less, you're going to be less likely to exactly. create resistance, yeah. is that what I'm... Probably, 
You know, I think a backyard beekeeper with a few hives is different from somebody with 400 hives. Right, obviously. Yeah. So we are going to close up because it's time. But so I guess I'd like to just urge people who really seriously want to keep bees to consider it to be an actively engaged hobby or pursuit. And definitely to look into Vermont Beekeepers Association, because it is, it, by the way, it started in 1886, and it's the oldest continually operating bee club in the country. There were some that started earlier, but then they had a hiatus for whatever reason. So look into VBA. Um, get that bear fence. I think if you're like me. don't know about <laughs> beekeeping. <laughs> so I, I, so I hope you'll...